بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we shall start inshallah studying the chapter that deals with Salatul Khawf or the prayer of fear and as we know that this prayer was mentioned in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, where Allah Azza wa Jal describes to His Prophet what to do when they are in times of fear and facing the enemies, how to pray. And this prayer is a clear indication that the prayer in congregation is mandatory upon every individual. Because if it was not mandatory, then it would have been easier for people at times of war to pray each one on his own. But because congregational prayer is mandatory, it was mandated also in the state of fear. And the Prophet ﷺ prayed the prayer of fear in a number of different formats, depending on the location of the enemy whether they are in the direction of the Qibla or behind the Qibla. Also, depending on the severity of the fear, if the fear was extreme or the fear was light, depending on if there are skirmishes or not, if there is any fighting or not. And the scholars reported a number of different ways of praying it. Ibn Hazm, said that 14 different ways of praying it are authentic. Imam al-Nawawi says they are approximately 16. And Ibn al-Arabi says they are 24. And Ibn al-Qayyim, after scrutinizing all of these, said that they're either six or seven. This is the most authentic opinion, but because of the number of different narrations, whenever there's a slight difference, they would make it a separate prayer. We have three hadiths, I believe, with us in this chapter. The first hadith, number 152. Narrated Abdullah ibn Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, led us in prayer during the days when he met the enemy in battle. A group of the Muslims stood up with him in prayer when the other group were facing the enemy. So he led in prayer those who were with him one rakah. They went to stand guard while the others came forward to pray with the Prophet So he led them in one rakah of prayer. Then the two groups completed in turn the remaining rakah. In this prayer, we see that the Prophet led two rak'ahs, a prayer of two rak'ahs, normally. He did not give any attention or special care for those praying behind him. One group stood guarding, and the other group prayed with the Prophet the first rak'ah. So the Prophet prayed one rak'ah, finished his rak'ah, and stood up for the second. Once he stood up for the second rak'ah, the group that prayed with him the first left and took their guard. The other group who did not pray came immediately and joined the Prophet ﷺ in his second rak'ah. The Prophet continued his second rak'ah and finished his prayer and offered salam. And then each group continued their own rak'ahs on their own. Each group continued the remaining rak'ah on their own. Now, this format the Prophet did not do anything extra to the two parties. He prayed two normal rak'ah, and they themselves prayed one rak'ah and completed it afterwards, though there was a big gap. The first group offered the second rak'ah after the Prophet ﷺ concluded his prayer, leaving a very big gap going in the direction other than the qibla, moving, carrying the arm. All of this does not affect your prayer when you're praying the prayer of fear. Now we have another format 
And this is in hadith number 153. Yes, brother. From Yazid ibn Ruman, from Saleh ibn Khawad ibn Jubair, from one who prayed along with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prayer on the occasion of Tahtul Riqah, fear prayer. A group of Muslims lined up for the prayer with the Prophet while the other group faced the enemy. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led those who were with him in one rakah of prayer and then remained standing while those with him completed the prayer individually. Then they left and lined up facing the enemy. While the other group came forward and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led them in prayer, completing the rakat that remained for him. Then he remained in the sitting position while those with him completed their prayer individually. Then he completed the prayer with Taslim. The one who prayed with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Sahal ibn Abi Hatma al-Bukhari. Hatma. Okay. That Salih ibn Khawat ibn Jubair, he is reporting this from a companion who prayed with the Prophet ﷺ. Now the prayer is different here. The prayer, the Prophet is trying to prolong it so that each one of the groups can finish his prayer with the Prophet or at least have something to do with the Prophet. So the first format would be the Prophet would pray the first rak'ah alongside one of the group with him. And then, after he finishes one rak'ah, he stands up for the second and he prolongs his recitation. The first group who prayed one rak'ah completes the second rak'ah, concludes the prayer, goes to the watch. And the Prophet is still in the second rak'ah. They finish their prayer ahead of the Prophet huh? They prayed with him how many rak'ahs? One. When he stood for the second, they stood for the second and finished their second and offered the tashahud, offered the salam, then took their arms and went to the watch. The second group came and prayed with the Prophet والسلام, their first rak'ah, which is the second rak'ah for the Prophet. Understood? When the Prophet sat for the tashahud, he prolonged his tashahud so that they would stand up and pray their second rak'ah, bow, raise their heads from bowing, prostrate, prostrate again, and then offer tashahud with the Prophet, and then the Prophet would offer salam, and they would offer salam with him. And this way, he was fair with both. He was fair with the first group who prayed from the beginning a full rak'ah with him, and he was fair with the second group who prayed a full rak'ah with him and offered salam. The first group managed to get takbir, the second group managed to get the salam. So this is one way of doing it again. We move on to the third way, which is hadith 154. Yes. From Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, who said, I witnessed along with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salatul Khawf. He formed ourselves into two ranks, rows of prayers. One rank behind the Messenger of Allah with the enemy between us and the Qibla. The Prophet said, Allahu Akbar, and we did likewise. Then he bowed and we all bowed. Then he raised up his head from his bowing, so we all raised our heads from bowing. Then he went down into prostration, and the row that was behind him also prostrated, while the row that was standing remained standing, facing the enemy. So, when the Prophet completed the prostration, and the row which was with him stood up, the rare rank of the Muslim made prostrations stood up again and then came forward, while the first row went back. Here, the Prophet ﷺ performed bowing and we all bowed. Then he raised up his head from the bowing and we all raised up our head. Then he made prostrations. He and the row that was just behind him that had previously been the rear rank in the first rakah, while the rear rank stood up facing the enemy. When the Prophet ﷺ completed the prostration along with those who were just behind him, then the rare rank of the Muslims made prostrations, and then the Prophet proclaimed the Taslim, and we all did likewise. Sahih al-Bukhari. This prayer is when the enemy is facing us. So the Prophet ﷺ prays normal prayer, two rakahs. They all pray together, 
they bow together. They say, Sami Allah Ali bin Hamidah together. And then the Prophet goes for prostration, him and the row behind him. But the second row remain armed and waiting. Until they finish their sujood, they stand up and the first row that offered sujood with the Prophet ﷺ retreat. Of course, the second row offered their tashahud when these guys stand up. So once they finish, they retreat and they take the place of the second row and the second row takes the place of the first row. And they offer the same. The first row offers the second rak'ah with the Prophet and with the sujood. Of course, they all bow together. But when it comes to sujood, the row that is behind the Prophet is the one who does it with him. And likewise, when the Prophet is in the tashahud position, the second row who did not offer sujood, as they were sitting, they offered their sujood and then they offer their tashahud together and they offer the salam together. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Nowadays, one would say, Sheikh, this is difficult because the arms and the weaponry and the format of the army is far different than how it used to be at the time of the Prophet Actually, it's not that different because at times you have to stay on guard. And when you stay on guard, you have battalions and you have different groups. And these different groups are not engaging in war 24-7. Maybe they would fight a couple of hours and rest of the day. So the time they were resting, when they prayed, this can be applicable. But if it's a case of bombing, and firefighters and uh, combat that is in the city and people are so afraid to be shot or killed in this case scholars say once the fight is on it is permissible to pray in any way individually alone while walking while sitting while standing while jumping with your back to the qibla all of this does not affect because when there is real true combat and fighting and firing, then in this case, you pray in any way or any form. It is possible for you to pray because your life becomes a priority rather than wasting your life for something that Allah Azza wa has given you permission not to do it. But when talking about normal situations where you have guards and you're guarding the area but there's no actual combat you're afraid that there might be actual combat in this case yes you may choose whatever suitable way of the prayers of fear do we have any questions before we go on to the following chapter yes brother assalamu alaikum sheikh salam sheikh last time we met we were uh, talking about prayers of rain is it correct that the musalla should be outside the residential area and people going there should walk barefooted? Because I have seen it once. As for walking barefooted, there isn't anything part of the sunnah of such. The Prophet ﷺ generally told us that either walk wearing your sandals or walk barefooted, but don't wear a sandal in one foot and walk barefooted one foot. This is the way of shaitan. This is the way that shaitan wears his sandals. But there is no indication or no preference in going barefooted to anywhere. Nowhere in Islam that it tells us walk barefooted. Yes, the Prophet sometimes walked barefooted, but this is not part of the sunnah that he has told us to do it. Maybe it was something he wanted to do, resting his feet probably or else. As for the musalla, yes, the sunnah is the musalla to be outside the buildings. And this was applicable when you had few people. And this is still applicable in villages or in small towns. But in big cities, to go outside of the city borders, this would probably mean that you have to drive for about two or three hours at least. And this would not be possible if you know that Eid prayer is about an hour after Fajr. 
So if you're going to pray Fajr and end up going on reaching the Musalla, which is three hours drive, you will probably pray Dhuhr instead. So it is permissible to be prayed within the buildings, within the houses, but in an open area. And Allah Azza wa knows best. The Salahs that we just spoke about, are we supposed to offer them loudly? The Imam is supposed to recite loudly or quietly? That's number one. And number two question is, we spoke about sacrifice. In India, there is a belief, I don't know if it's from Hadith or Quran, uh, that the sacrifice will be used on the Sirat. We have, we'll be sitting on the sacrifice and it'll help us take us from the Sirat. Can you please explain us about that? As for the second question, there is nothing to state that your sacrifice will be waiting for you at the Sirat at all. It is the Prophet والسلام, who would be waiting for you at the Sirat and he would say, Rabbi Sallim Sallim. And you will pass and your sacrifice has nothing to do with passing the Sirat. As for the first question, uh, is the prayer of fear to be recited loudly or silently? It depends on the time. So if you're praying Dhuhr or Asr, you're praying it silently. It's not a separate Salah. The Salat of fear is not a separate Salah. It is the five mandatory prayers to be prayed. So if it's Fajr, it's going to be loud. If it's Dhuhr, Asr, it's going to be silent. If it's Maghrib and Isha, it's going to be loud as well. Excuse me, Sheikh, sorry. The Salah of the Eclipse as well. The Eclipse Salah. Eclipse is loud all the time, during morning or evening. It is always allowed. Assalamu alaikum. My question is that besides the cloak in Salatul Istisqa, we turn the cloak. So is there any authentic hadith of turning the hands while supplicating? There isn't any authentic hadith to my knowledge on this. People say that, some scholars mention this in their books, saying that when you ask Allah for forgiveness or for mercy of something that is good, you open your hands likewise. But if you want Allah Azza wa to protect you from a calamity, from drought, from earthquake, and there, they say that there is the similar to the eclipse prayer, even if there is earthquakes or volcanoes or a thunderstorm that is fearful and it's, it's hazardous, it is permissible to pray as well for it, similar to the eclipse until it goes. So they say that when you want Allah to protect you from something, you do this. But there isn't anything, to my knowledge, from the authentic sunnah. It's mentioned in the books of fiqh, but it is not backed by an authentic hadith. And if there is an authentic hadith, then it is our madhab to follow. Brahman. Sheikh, regarding the prayer of fear, what is at the time of Juma the fighting is going on? So is the prayer uh, of Juma what, what is to be done? Like pray like Zohar or what? Most likely. Fear prayer takes place at battle time. And when a person is in battle, usually he is traveling. And therefore, Jum'ah does not happen when people are traveling uh, on the road or off-road. We know, we did not mention this, but Jum'ah cannot be performed except in towns. So Bedouins who live far away from the town in the tents, they do not pray Jum'ah. And those who are travelers in the middle of the road, let's say we have a caravan of six or seven cars or buses, and we have like 50 or 60 people traveling together for Hajj. And it's time for Jum'ah, and they're on the way to Mecca. We tell them, stop and offer Jum'ah prayer. No. Jum'ah prayer is only to be performed in cities and towns and villages where people reside. When people are not residing, and that is why if people are living on an oil rig offshore and they are drilling oil and they stay there for three, four months, do they pray Jum'ah? There is no. It's not a place of residing, it's not a village. So I hope this answers your question. Assalamu alaikum. Salam. Last time when we were talking about uh, the book of Salatul Eidain, so, uh, like when we pray Fajr Salah on the day of Jumu'ah, so that time uh, it was the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, 
to recite a specific surah like surah surah sajda and surah dahar so is there any specific surah to be recited on the day of eid on the day of eid it is prescribed as the authentic sunnah to recite surah qaf and surah al-qamar qaf al quran al-majid and surah iqtarabat al-sa'atu wa anshaqqa al-qamar or the other alternative is to recite surah al-a'la and surah al-ghashiyah as you do in the friday sermon yes now we have been discussing about salatul khawf salatul kusuf and salatul aidan is there any specific dua which is to be recited during the salah there isn't any specific dua to be recited in the prayers themselves but for for example al istisqa there is a number of duas that the prophet used to ask allah azza wa jal to give and they are quite long and they're quite difficult even in arabic because it is strong language but it all revolves on asking allah azza wa jal for pure water that is enough for the crops and that would even feed the animals and the people etc and the prophet is asking for that but other than that uh, the fear prayer the khusuf the eclipse we don't have any specific dua for them assalamu alaikum uh, what if we end the salah of the eclipse before the eclipse has been not over so is there any issue in that's a good question what happens if the imam ends the prayer thinking that the eclipse is over and he concludes the prayer and he goes out and the eclipse is not over does he pray again the answer is no if he believed and thought that the eclipse was over and he concludes the prayer you cannot pray again and that is why it's better to be safe than sorry prolong it even if the eclipse was over keep on praying until someone comes to you and tells you that the eclipse was over or if you feel that the eclipse is over and you conclude your prayer this is sufficient assalamu alaikum shaykh assalamu. i want to ask that during uh, salatul khusuf if during maghrib the eclipse ar 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 arises uh, due, and due to which we start we do not pray on maghrib and first we start with a uh, salatul khusuf and it uh, the eclipse is long a bit long and we have the fear that we'll miss the time of maghrib so should we conclude our salah with regard to your question you should have started with maghrib because Maghrib's time is very limited. And as stated before, you could not get closer to Allah with any form of deed more and better than what He has obliged and made mandatory upon you. So you should have started with Maghrib and then went ahead with the eclipse. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fiyamanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.